In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. If you notice, today is a gospel that we are very familiar with. Everybody's familiar with this story of the five loaves and the two fish. And no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, it's one of the first stories even we teach to our kids. One of the first miracles of Christ that we teach to our kids is the five loaves and the two fish. And it's very popular. And actually, another thing is that if you notice, it's read on multiple occasions in the church. Um, it's, you know, if, you know, if you really focus on the calendar, on the Coptic calendar, you will see that whenever there is a Coptic month that has five Sundays, so that's one extra Sunday, we call that the Sunday of blessing, and we call this the gospel of blessing. So it's read every time there's like an extra Sunday. This is how beautiful our church is. This is truly how beautiful and, and how deep and amazing the Orthodox Church is. That even in these little details, we take the opportunity, the fathers take that, like the church fathers, the early church fathers, took the opportunity that even when we have an extra week, let's take advantage of this and make it a spiritual kind of commemoration. You'll notice every detail in the church is like this, is a, is a spiritual commemoration. So today we'll talk a little bit about the five loaves and the two fish. We'll talk about a few points, the significance of the miracle, the meaning of the loaves and the fish in our lives, ensuring how to ensure that God blesses our offering. As we said, this is the Sunday of blessing. And the leftover fragments. And then how do we start today? But before I get into the sermon, I wanted to com comment on one thing in the readings, if you're paying attention, in the Acts. If you notice, it was from 1 Corinthians and it focused on the talent of speaking in tongues. And it's very important. I wanted to comment on this real quick because if, you know, as Christians today, if you get approached by anybody, <clears throat> one of the very first questions they're going to ask you, do you speak in tongues in your church? Because it's one of these things that is taken way out of context today. Okay. It's taken way out of context and it is taken very in a, in a way that actually makes Christianity not make sense rather than it being edifying. Everything in Christianity is edifying. That's why even when we start the liturgy in the in the in the Lamb we say peace and edification to the one holy Catholic Apostolic Orthodox Church. Okay? So Saint Paul here, in order for you to understand, you have to look at two things. The first thing is the context of what he's writing. Who is he writing to? He's writing to the Corinthians. For those of you who read a little bit into history or know a little bit about the 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 details of, of Corinthians. Corinthians were like the trouble child for St. Paul, okay? If you have kids, there's always, usually it's the middle child. I, nothing against middle children, but usually one of the children, if you have more than one, is crazy, okay? The Corinthians were the crazy ones. They're the ones that made like St. Paul's beard probably white, okay? So, you know, they're the ones that made him age. They're the ones that made the thorn that he had worse, all that stuff. So one of the things is that they were compete like they were there was so much drama and they were competing over the talents that were in the church. They were competing over like which one has more gifts? My gift is better than yours. Ha 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 like stuff like that. It was literally getting to this point. I'm simplifying it but it's it's something that's it's kind of sad. Okay? And so St. Paul when he wrote to them, you'll notice in 1 Corinthians he writes a lot about like how we look at the talents that God gives. And so when he says that, you know, I could stand here and speak in five tongues, but why would I when I can just, or I can speak in tongues, but why, why not just say five useful words that are edifying? So here he's not saying that, oh, you know, I'm going to stand here and say gibberish like we see on TV today. No, he's talking about the fact that he could, that, you know, he is able to, if, if he, you know, this talent is not as like uh, amazing or as much of a bragging right as you're making it, Corinthians. You know, it's better to stand here and say just a few words and that you're understood than to focus on things that are given to you to preach. If you're already here, you're already in church, everybody understands the same language. Why are you focusing on these things that, yes, were relevant to the apostles during the upper room because there were people gathered that spoke different languages. So why are you focusing on that so much? Right. And we see forms of this kind of boasting sometimes even in our communities and things like that. Oh, who has a better voice? Who gives a better sermon? All these things. But what's important is not all of this. What St. Paul is talking about here is how should we have the true Christian attitude? Unfortunately, this chapter is taken out of context and it said, oh, look, 
St. Paul speaks in tongues. The Corinthians speak in tongues. Therefore, anybody can speak in tongues. If we're Christians, we speak in tongues. No, that's not how it works. So it's important to look at the context of what we're reading in order for us to understand. And we have to understand these things in order for when people approach us, we know how to respond. It's very critical. You have to understand how to respond. You have to understand why we believe what we believe. You have to understand why we cannot just look at, you know, a talent that was given at some point as something that is a rule. If you're Christian, then you have to have every single talent. And the same thing with prophecy, the, how prophecy is misunderstood and things like that. I just wanted to comment, Kida. Sometimes there are verses that I come across. I'm like, Lala, I have to speak about it. I'm about Darsh. I can't. Okay. Now, back to the five loaves and two fish. Happier subject. Okay. So, we said we're going to speak about the significance of the miracle. So, every miracle that Christ did is a timeless lesson to help us get closer to Him. Christ doesn't do anything kid randomly. He doesn't do anything to show off. He doesn't do anything just to, you know, just to, to flex His miraculous works. That's not how Christ works. Christ, any miracle, any lesson He gave is a timeless lesson for all of us. It's timeless. It applies to every age in Christianity. Okay? The proof is this miracle, how it's popular it is among us throughout the generations. This is the only miracle that was mentioned in all four Gospels. In all four Gospels, this miracle is mentioned. Of course, some with other details than others, but this miracle is the only miracle of Christ that is mentioned in all four Gospels. It's mentioned in Matthew 14, in Mark chapter 6, in Luke chapter 9, and in John chapter 6. Okay, and then another thing is that there is no such thing as an insignificant talent or gift. Okay, the idea of a talent or gift, like this is what's significant of it, is that there's no such thing as when, when Christ gives me a talent, I'm not talking about speaking in tongues, I'm talking about like any talent that we have. Like if you play music, if you have a nice voice, if you're able to draw, if you even are able to have the patience to read books, which is something that is not very common today, all these things, any talent that Christ gives you, any gift that Christ gives you, it's not in, nothing ever to, in God's eyes is insignificant. Everything is worth something, even five loaves and two fish in, the, in a gathering of 5,000 was relevant. And finally, God blesses what is little in our eyes and understanding. Sometimes we look at things from a human perspective. We look at things in the, in the, in the sense that, you know, Logically speaking, scientifically speaking, you know, this is not, this is not, you know, making any sense. But with Christ, everything that is little is blessed. Anything that I look at in my human eyes as insignificant, Christ can use it and make it way more than, than what I can imagine or what anybody can comprehend for the glory of his name. The second point we said we would talk about is the idea of ensuring that God blesses our offering. If you noticed the offering in this miracle here, there was, so the context, there's a miracle that happened among 5,000 people. There's a gathering, Christ is preaching. And of course, you know, they weren't just from around the area, okay? Like imagine people gathered from all over the place to listen to Christ. They discovered where he was. They went up to this remote place, okay, no cars, no Uber, nothing. Everyone had to walk. And they were a long distance. And if you know anything about the setting, you know that in the evening, at night, there's wild animals. There's no way for them to see. There's n like no lighting. So it's impossible for them to get back home. Or even if they do, you know, it's, it's a journey to get back home. And there's no food. There's nothing. They just want to listen to Christ. And so in this setting... You know, they lose track of time because they're just enjoying the company of Christ. And all of a sudden, you know, they discover, hey, we have a little problem, just a tiny little problem. We have uh, all these people and we have nothing to feed them. Taban, for us, for you who come from an Egyptian background, you know, this is a disaster. If there's a gathering and there's no food, this is like you know, the Antichrist is at the door, right? Yani, um, so they're sitting there, you know, there's no food. What are we going to do? And then this offering comes out of nowhere, right? Christ tells them, you give them something to eat, and then this offering comes out of nowhere. So here is the significance of this part of the miracle. Christ said to them, you give them to eat. Logically, 
is it going to be possible for the apostles to give all these people something to eat? No, they're going to be like, you know, Christ, I, you must have, you've been speaking for like 10 hours. I guess you're, you're not comprehending the situation, right? If this was us today, you're not comprehending what's going on. We've got thousands of people. What do you mean you give them to eat? Where are we going to, how? How is this possible? The idea here is Christ wanted them to learn something. He wanted them to learn, always be ready to give from your hearts. And this applies to us today. Always be ready to give from, from your heart. Even if you think that you don't, you don't, you're not talented. You don't have anything to offer. It's not about money. I'm talking about anything. Let's say somebody is going through a sad situation in life. Somebody's sad and needs a comforting word. But I'm not a good speaker. I don't know, I don't know what to say. These situations are, are so awkward. Or as the kids call today, awk. This is so awk. I can't do this. I don't know what to say. Right? No. Just say what you can. Say what you can. Offer, offer from, from your heart. At least pray for, for, for those who are going through trouble. Right? And this idea of being ready is how we start to see Christ's work in our life. Being ready to give. Being ready to offer. Have the attitude to offer. Have the attitude to give. And Christ will do the rest. Um, and as it says in Acts chapter 20, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Sometimes we calculate, everything is a calculated risk, right? You have to calculate and make sure there's no risk. I don't want to have to risk anything. I want to visit my friend, but my friend you know, lives in a bar bad part of town or uh, gas is expensive these days. Why not just meet somewhere in the middle? Things like that. But we, we have to always remind ourselves that it is more blessed to give than to receive. The second thing is when it comes to our offering being blessed, when we offer anything to God. So we said the attitude, right, of, of giving and the desire to give. The second thing is the importance of, of having a system of being organized it's, nothing is random if you notice in our church everything has a system every right has a system every season has a system even with the tunes even with the hymns even with with everything one beautiful thing that you have here in in saint paul actually that i really like is even the hymns when they're on the screen there's musical notes it's very it's nice it's very nice in order for us to be all going by one system this idea of system is something critical and crucial. And without it, we will not see the work of God in our life. And without it, our offering, whatever we offer to God, will not be accepted. Or we won't feel it being accepted. If you notice in the miracle, Christ, Christ told them what? As soon as they told him, we have nothing, like uh, give them to eat. And they were like, what? What are you talking about? What did he tell them to do? Make them sit down in groups of 50. Make them sit down in groups of 50. That's the first thing Christ said. The first instruction in the miracle. Make them sit down in groups of 50. And this, of course, is in order for, every, for nobody to be missed, for everyone to be served, for everything to be focused, for everything to be organized. This is Christ. This is Christ. And this is one of the, the things that is preserving our church until today. The rights and the systems that we have, the organization, the conservatism that is in the church to conserve all these rules, all these things, is what's keeping the church, our church alive today and thriving. And even in the middle of the persecutions, in any age, the, the church grows and grows and grows. Why? Because we never compromise this organization. And this is why it's always stressed. Let's keep, you know, the reverence of the church. Let's be organized. Let's obey, right, this idea of obedience. So, again, listening, listening to, the, to the calling from Christ and having the desire to give <clears throat> and having a system in my life, being organized. The next part, so after this, you know, when Christ blesses the five loaves and the two fish, this little offering that seems irrelevant to, to all of us, right, logically, and they sit in groups of, of 50 and he blesses and he, he passes, you know, he gives it to the disciples to give the people to eat. We read something that sometimes we overlook. It says what? So they all ate and were filled and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. 12 baskets of fragments. The leftovers. Nothing was was wasted. 
and they collected 12 fragments. You can look at this part in many ways. Sometimes we look at it like, look, Christ did not, you know, Christ always wanted to send a message that we shouldn't waste, so we shouldn't waste food. You can look at it this way. You can look at it in, in the way that, oh, you know, <clears throat> look how much was left over. But there's something that we can really look at in a spiritual way. The idea, first of all, that the work of God does not only feed, but it also fills, it satisfies. One thing in our life, when we're talking about blessing, when we're talking about the voice of God in our life, God's work in our life, if we truly feel God's work in our life, we won't only just pass the day by, but we will feel filled. Trust me. And this is something that, that I've, I've seen myself. Many people, you know, when they're away from the church or <clears throat> when they are, you know, in other beliefs or anything like this and they come to the church, one of the first things they say or feel is before we came to church, before we came closer to Christ, we felt like something was missing. Something was missing. Having Christ in our life means we are filled, we are satisfied. The world around us today always wants to convince us what you have is not enough. What you have is not good enough. You know, as soon as you buy your new phone, your new computer, your new car, it becomes right away old, right? Right away becomes old, right away becomes irrelevant because there's something greater, something newer, something better coming out. But this is not the case with Christ. With Christ, it's all about contentment and true contentment, meaning that I truly feel filled. The second thing is, with Christ, no fragment is left behind. Everybody is equal in the eyes of Christ. Everyone is loved the same. A small fragment or a full loaf is relevant. Christ didn't let even the small fragments be wasted. The devil tries to belittle us, make us feel worthless, hopeless, that there is no point in repenting. The world around us is just too messed up. It's not worth fighting this spiritual fight. I will never overcome this habitual sin that I that I am having. I am never going to overcome this habit that is killing me. I'm never going to be able to change. All this is something that the devil puts in our hearts. But with Christ, even the fragments, no matter how weak or worthless we look to the world, we are so precious in the eyes of Christ. He didn't let one fragment go to waste. The last thing is, there are many fragments that we have in our life or many small things that we can look at when it comes to the 12 or to the 12 baskets. We can look at the fragments in a way of things that we take for granted. Okay, one thing that I see it's that we all are guilty of here in America is, for example, when we go to a restaurant or we order food or something, as soon as I'm done, even if I take a to-go box, most of the time this to-go box goes in the garbage a lot of the time, right? Or part of it that I don't like goes in the garbage. And this is something that we just kind of, you know, we take it for granted. In our spiritual life, there are little things that we take for granted, kind of like the to-go box. I'll call them, I'll call these the, the to-go box of our spiritual life, okay? Number one, time. We take time for granted. Even though time is the one thing in this world that we will never get back. Money, you can get back. No matter how much money you lose, you can gain it back. Success, you can gain it back. Grades, yani, you're, if, you're, if, you're a, if you're in school and you get bad grades and your parents are Egyptian, you'll suffer for a bit, but you can still make it up later on, okay? So on and so forth. Everything you can get back. The one thing that you will never get back is time. Every second that you spend is a, is a second you will never get back. And we take it for granted. I will pray tomorrow. From today to tomorrow is at least 12 hours, is at least 24 hours that you're never getting back. It's when you really think about it, it's horrible. Um, the second thing is little small habits that we take for granted. Honesty, for example. You know, one thing that my parents told me about Egypt, I lived in Egypt for only a few years, but one thing that like growing up I always heard is the fact that like big companies in Egypt, for example, or, or banks or things like that, traditionally, 
all the jobs handling money or anything where somebody's needing to be trustworthy were always given to Christians because it's known that Christians anywhere in the world are very trustworthy, very honest. This is something we take for granted. We have something called white lies. We have something called, it's just a, I just, I don't want to have to deal with the drama. I don't ha- I want to, f- you know, if I can avoid any any drama or any headache, then it's, it's, I'll go confess. I'll go confess. As if confession is like, you know, like something that you add get onto like a tab in a restaurant or something and you confess one, get one free or something. That's not how it works. There has to be a repentance. So honesty, honesty is a very small thing that we take for granted sometimes. And even sometimes in our jobs or things like that, you know, we, we, we see how we can trick the system. While these, these little habits build up, a fragment by itself is nothing. But 12 baskets of fragments builds up. It fills up. These little things kid, that, we, that we say, I'll tell you a funny story. You know, sometimes kid, that, you know, when I teach the kids about confession, when they come and confess, and let's say it's something that they, that they do all the time or something like that, the kids always assume that Abuna like remembers what they confessed a year ago, which is like, Habibi, we, we take many confessions. Like, I'm not going to remember what, what you said. So sometimes the kids will come in, Abuna, the regular, like with caramel or vanilla. Any, <laughs> any, what, what the, you know, it's like uh, these, these little things that we say, just the, the, the regular sins, ya Abuna, uh, lying, uh, lying, saying bad words, uh, the normal, any, like, I didn't kill anyone. Right? These little things that we look at as like worthless, these, these little regular sins, these are all little habits that, that actually they build up and they shape me from inside of what kind of Christian that I am, whether I'm a true Christian or not. So these small habits make a big difference. The last small fragment is something called purity of my senses. We sometimes take this for granted. We live in a world today filled with things that attack all of our senses, whether it's things we see, things we hear, things we think about, compromising our fast, so things we taste. All of our senses are under attack. The purity of my senses. The Bible says if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for your eye to be thrown in hellfire than your entire body to be thrown in hellfire. This, of course, does not mean that I want you, like we're going to go and and pluck our eyes out. No. But the idea here is Christ is saying for us to take the extreme measure to repent, the extreme measure to cut off whatever is affecting my senses. So if my phone is causing me to look at things that are not appropriate, it should be cut out. If if there's a certain application that is causing me to stumble or causing others to stumble, it should be cut out. If there are certain things, whether games, I remember during COVID, for example, one of the most popular things was like games and people like we play like online with friends and things like this. And one time, Kida, I I, I I played with a friend, and then there's something Kida that is horrible called the lobby. And this lobby is when you hear everybody that is in the game, and the things that are said was I was like Yani, it was it was horrible. We're horrible things, always said. And even when people don't participate, you know, like me and my friends wouldn't participate, for example. But I started to see like that, that it just gets more and more toxic. And then the trend over time, at that time I was a servant in the church, I wasn't ordained yet. I, I saw like from the beginning of COVID to like a few months later that the kids started to say words and expressions and things like, uh, like where did you learn this? Where did you learn how to say these things? These are things that attack the purity of our senses. These little things that we take for granted. Oh, it's okay, Annie, they're having fun with their friends. No, we have to be very careful what our kids are being exposed to. We have to be very careful what they're listening to, what they're watching. Even worse today, even on the on like Disney Plus and Netflix and things like this, all these things now have an agenda that are directly, directly targeting the kids. We have to pay attention. And one of the things that really bothers me is when I see like a, a parent leaving their kid with their phone, watching YouTube Kids or Disney Plus or something like this. It bothers me. Whether, of course, in the church, but even outside, why? Because it's very, like these things are not safe anymore. We have to be very careful and not take these things for granted. You know, it's better to try and, 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 and yani, for us to 
struggle a little bit at first and teach our kids how to be quiet without the phone than take the easy way and just, oh, they get quiet as soon as they look at the screen. Because you will suffer the consequences of this later on when they have things in their mind that will be very difficult to change after, you know, in, in a few years. So these little things, the purity of senses, our senses are under attack and we have to pay attention to this. Finally, how do I start today? You know, you're, you're probably sitting there saying, Abuna, you give a lot of spiritual uh, advice and talked about a lot of things and you're ranting, but give us something practical. So here's the practical part. Number one, try to plant yourself always in a God-fearing environment and listen. The, 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 the first thing to do for us to start having blessing in our life, for us to hear God's voice in our life, for us to, for God to accept what we have to offer, is plant yourself in a God-fearing environment and listen, just like the people did that went to listen to Christ. Plant yourself with God-fearing friends, in God-fearing gatherings. Try to make your spiritual life your priority. The second thing is to strive to have a spirit of unity. The idea of unity. If you notice in this miracle, it united everybody together. And every miracle that Christ did united everyone together. The spirit of unity in the church is very important. Is it okay to have differences with other people? Of course. We were all created to be unique. The world wants to convince us that we are different. We are different. And if you don't accept the difference, then you are a bigot. The, but the church, Christ teaches that we are unique. And this uniqueness is actually what glues us together. Not like what the world says. The world wants everyone to, be looked, to look at themselves as different, as rejected, as separated. Christ wants us to realize that through our, our differences, through our uniqueness, this is something that makes us unique and we complete each other. Does that make sense? It's very important for us to realize this. So we always have to strive to have the spirit of unity, to have unity, and to avoid the things that destroy unity in our life. The third and final thing is to submit and trust God. When Christ told the apostles, make them sit down in groups of 50, they didn't say, what are you going to do? What do you think you're doing? Why? These are 5,000 people. Why, why make them sit? What's going to happen when they sit in a group of 50? Muhammad, they're already sitting down. Why waste time? Submit and trust God. Submission doesn't come without obedience. Practice being obedient. We teach our kids all the time to be obedient. But sometimes whenever anything, for example, is said in the church or something is said that I don't like, I question it. Submission and trust for God. And when I do this, I will not just be fed, but I will be filled. I will be filled. And finally, pay attention to the small things in life. In your prayer, learn to have a spirit of thanksgiving. Because when we thank God from our hearts in our prayer, when we start with thanksgiving, we remember those little things. We remember everything. And don't just say like the thanksgiving prayer, just get a recite and that's it. Let's get thanks to my nephews and my nephews. Great, I finished in 30 seconds. Awesome, let's aim for 20 next time. No, try to focus on the words and try to actually thank God in every step for things that you may not remember or, or things that may be for granted. And through this, over time, you will find yourself living a life full of contentment and blessing. I've seen people throughout my life that had everything financially, very rich, had everything and they were not happy and people that were struggling to just keep food on the table but they're so happy and they're so content and they have so much joy in their lives them and their kids and you see this in the world today suicide rates and and depression rates are highest among those who are rich those who have money the celebrities if you look at the celebrities on tv or anything like this yeah they look happy in movies and they're funny ha 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 all this stuff but when you look at an interview, for example, with somebody who's a comedian or something like that, they're miserable. They have everything, but they're miserable. Why? Why? Because they do not have this spirit of thanksgiving. They do not, they do not have this, this valuable thing that we have. While others who, you know, like a family, like a crazy stories from Egypt, yani, or, or even from here. People, yani, there's families that live, like families of four or five that live in a two-bedroom apartment, but they're so happy and pleasant and everybody wants to be their friend and they're very successful in school. 
How? What is the secret here? What is the key? It is a life of thanksgiving. May God give us blessing in our life always, and may He multiply all the blessings that we have in our lives and accept our offerings, and glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.